Several years ago, I was at a Houston Astros baseball game in the Houston Astrodome. And that gives you a clue as to how long ago that was. And we were sitting in the mezzanine, which is about a third of the way up in that stadium from the field. And down on the front row of that level was a group of grade school boys who were having a big time and they were cutting up and they were throwing ice on the people down below them. And security came over and asked them to straighten up real good and they did. And that was before the game even started. And their dads were sitting behind them. And as the game progressed, they started acting up a bit and having a good time and security came over to them and asked them to straighten up just a bit and they did. Our kids are watching us and they imitate our behavior and mimic the patterns of our lives. Our kids are a gift from God and it's on us to steward over them well and to position them to grow in Christ and thrive in the midst of the fullness of life. Right or wrong, good or bad, our behavior and our convictions are certainly taught. They are also and much more so caught. And what if we were very intentional about the catching and the teaching of our faith? What if our children's caught our faith because of our commitment to Christ and to each other and to the pursuit of holiness in the context of community? This morning, as we continue in this message from 1 Samuel, there are three things that I want to do. First, I wanna give the backstory to the scripture that Hadley read. Second, I wanna identify some parallels in the scripture between then when Samuel lived and now, our present day and time. And then third, I wanna cast a vision for what it means for us to position our children to thrive. So first, the backstory. We met a man, as Hadley read, named Elkanah, who had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Elkanah's first wife, Hannah, was barren, and in order to keep the family name and line going, Elkanah married Penina. In verse two, we're told, just point blank, Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Elkanah was a good man. He was devoted to the Lord, and every year he went up with his entire household from his town to worship the Lord and make sacrifice to him in the city of Shiloh, as was their custom. The culmination of every religious feast they celebrated was the slaying of animals, followed by a lavish meal eaten and enjoyed there in the Lord's presence. And the head of household would give portions of meat to his family and friends that made that journey with him. He would also give portions of meat to his wives in proportion to the number of children that they had. And to Hannah, who had none, no children, this man gave a double portion because he loved her. It says, the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. And because she had no children, her rival, Penina, kept bullying her. And this went on year after year. Her behavior, Penina's, her character, it stands in stark contrast to the character and behavior of Elkanah. And so year after year, Hannah's there worshiping God. Her rival is provoking her over and over until finally Hannah had all she could stand. She wept would not eat this choice meat that her husband gave, two portions of it. So out of concern for his bride, Elkanah would sit with her and he would listen and he consoled her in her grief and he encouraged her to eat, asking, why are you so downhearted? Well, after they finished eating and drinking and worshiping and sacrificing, Hannah had had enough of her rival's provocation and she was deep in anguish. I can feel the heat coming off of her teeth clenched as she's praying, oppressed with grief, weeping bitterly. And Hannah prayed these words, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer 
and give me a son. I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he'd been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. That's the Nazarite vow. In verse 12, Hannah was praying silently, so fervently, her lips moving, but she made no noise. And Eli the priest is watching from afar, perplexed and confused at what he sees. He thought she was drunk. But Hannah, in all sincerity and all humility, she assured Eli she was not. She bore her soul to him as to why she was pouring her heart out there in God's presence. And Eli spoke a word of blessing and honor and favor over this woman. And for Hannah, that time in God's presence changed everything. Her countenance changed. Her confidence soared. She trusted in God and was filled with joy and peace, which overflowed from hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Soon thereafter, Hannah became pregnant. She gave birth to a son and named him Samuel. And that's the backstory to the scripture that Hadley ran just read just a moment ago. Samuel's birth was over 3,000 years ago. And as much as things have changed in our world according or since that time, so much has remained the same. And so let's consider the parallels between then and now. And throughout this chapter one of 1 Samuel, we see both grace and trouble. So first, let's consider the trouble. Hannah was mocked in the first place because she was barren. She had no children. Scripture says children are a blessing from God and having them fulfills the very first commandment on biblical record. It is painful and troubling that Hannah is childless. It is ridiculous and troubling that Penina bullied Hannah. If Penina felt less than or unloved because Elkanah loved Hannah more, her feelings were justified. But that does not give her a reason to provoke anger or irritate her rival. Her rival, Hannah's rival, provoked Hannah in order to irritate her, and her grief drove her down to her knees where she prayed to the Lord out of the bitterness of her soul. But maybe even more troubling than being barren or being bullied is the outright ineptitude of Eli, the priest. Hannah was heartbroken, and when she'd finally had enough, she turned to the Lord, and her lengthy, silent prayer captivated Eli and led him to an illogical conclusion. He thought Hannah was drunk. One commentary said, on the one hand, Eli appeared to be doing his job, vigilantly guarding the sanctuary from possible desecration by Hannah. Really? Hannah's gonna desecrate the sanctuary. On the other hand, Eli was actually demonstrating his incompetence. Here as elsewhere, Eli's portrayed as a man unable to distinguish appearance from reality, as a man who himself lacked substance. Though Eli was the high priest of Shiloh and ostensibly a man of exceptional spiritual maturity, he is consistently depicted by the narrator as spiritually blind and inert, a man who watched lips then perceived heart, a man who judged profound spirituality to be profligate indulgence in spirits, who heard nothing when the Lord spoke. Eli was so out of tune and out of sync with God that it's troublesome. There is trouble in the scripture and there is trouble in the world. Did you know that one out of five students aged 12 to 18 are bullied? And adults are bullied as well. Comes in the form of gossip, slander, lying, being made fun of, verbally abused, physically abused, painfully excluded, and all that's heightened with social media. Where do we learn that behavior? How is it perpetuated in today's day and age. Oftentimes, it's learned by 
experience. Our own pain and suffering leads hurt people to hurt people. Insecurity abounds and bully, bullying happens when we don't know how to deal or resolve conflict or we don't know how to communicate with one another. And our bullying reflects the failure to acknowledge the image of God in another person. That is heartbroken, heartbreaking. Infertility is painful. Sometimes there's breakthrough. Many times there is not. Equally, the loss of a child is devastating. We're not supposed to bury our children before we ourselves die. And I pray that neither of those two things are your experience, but I know that they are the experience of some of us in the room. And if that's the case for you, God sees you. God knows you, and he is with you. Best of all, he's in you. Maybe worse than the pain caused by our own uh, suffering or bullying that we extend on another is the effect of poor spiritual leadership. Men or women who misrepresent themselves as spiritual leaders but care more about what other people think than what God thinks. They are neither faithful nor true, self-absorbed, misled. Lord, have mercy on us all. Save us to the uttermost as we keep our eyes fixed and focused on you. And therein lies the good news. There is trouble in the scripture. There is trouble in the world. But grace abounds in this world today as God has broken and is breaking in all the time. And we see it in the scripture where Elkanah is so faithful to lead his family and he positions them to experience the Lord, to remember and rehearse God's story year in and year out. Elkanah is so generous. He leads his family to worship, to offer sacrifice. He's full of integrity. He is caring and compassionate. And Hannah's leadership is not unlike her husband's. How beautiful is it that Hannah turns to the Lord in the midst of her pain? And the Lord filled her pain with his presence. Robert Bergen is a seminary professor who said, Hannah's pain made her a theologian. 1 Samuel is the first time on biblical record where this title is used, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the Lord Almighty. We read it earlier in Samuel 1, but Hannah uses that word in her address to God. In her simple prayer, she acknowledged that God alone is the giver of life. She is faithful to turn to the Lord, responsive to his leadership, and as a servant of God, she is submissive to him in all her ways. Three times in 1 Samuel 1 does it say, she is a servant of the Lord. Hannah's relationship with the Lord Almighty is more intimate and more substantive than was Eli's. And ultimately, she stewards her most prized possession by positioning Samuel to experience God's presence, giving him to the Lord for his whole life, it said. There is grace in the scripture. And ultimately that grace is reflected in the Lord God Almighty, who is the one to whom our sacrifices were made. Worship was given. He's the one who remembered his faithful servant, Hannah, and was responsive to her needs. Remember... Whenever the verb remember has God as its subject, it is salvific and is connected to the new thing that our covenant making and covenant keeping God is doing in order to achieve his purposes here in this world. It said the Lord remembered Hannah. God is the one who's wonderfully present to the extent that Samuel was to live in his presence for his whole life. There is grace in the scripture, there is grace throughout the scripture, and there is grace in the world today that reached its climax 2,000 years ago when the time was right and God stepped down out of heaven. 
Jesus Christ is the one who gave God a face and a name. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And when he did, because he did, he went from being right here on the outside of us to right here on the inside of those who repent, those who put their trust in him and claim his name. And that grace has been multiplied over and over and over again. And that grace, God's grace abounds today. Let me give you an example. Move United is an organization that uses the power of sport to push what's possible for people with disabilities, confronting ignorance, fueling conversation, and inciting action that leads us to a world where everyone is included. This past week at Move United Junior Nationals in Colorado Springs, our own Will Butts, Ninth grader this coming school year at Grace Community School, he broke the long jump national record, set a PR in the 400 and the 200, won the 100 and 1500 for his age group. He gold medaled five times in each of his races for his age at Junior Nationals. <laughs> Amen and glory to God. When Katie Butts learned she was pregnant, well over 15 years ago, and before she knew of Will's disability, she painted Psalm 139 over Will's crib, and incidentally, that was the number given to him to wear this week as he competed. He didn't ask for that number. When Will Butts was born, Reagan and Katie offered their son to the Lord for his whole life, and Will Butts is not defined by his ability not defined by his disability, not merely an athlete. He is a child of God, servant of God, son of the most high God who is thriving in the midst of the fullness of life. And his parents have positioned him for just that reason. So I've given you the backstory to 1 Samuel 1, and we've talked about the parallels between scripture and the world today. Let me cast a vision for us of what it means to position our children in Christ to thrive in the midst of the fullness of life. And let me speak to you parents who are in the room. You are your child's number one spiritual influence. Not Sarah Scott and not me. You are your child's number one spiritual influence. They are watching you practice your faith and live out your convictions. And that is caught as much as it is taught. One way it's caught is by coming to worship week in and week out and week in and week out and week in and week out. Are you with me? every week as we remember and rehearse God's salvation story that's ours in Christ Jesus, inclusive of the high and holy days, Christmas and Easter. But why is this space so important? It is so important because this is where our children learn how to worship by watching adults worship. And it's in this place where we all learn that I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And it's from within this place that we pursue holiness in the context of community with God and with each other. And here's the thing, transformation for me, for you, for our children, transformation only occurs, let me say it best occurs through relationship. Transformation happens through relationship with God and with each other. Presence matters. Faithful presence week in and week out. It matters to me. It matters for you. If you're in this room and you're not a parent, let me remind you of the vow you took when you joined this church to serve with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And more importantly than that, anytime we baptize infants, anytime we baptize children who are not of age to accept faith for themselves and respond in repentance, there is a responsibility that we have 
to be the gospel. It's a vow we take every time there's a baptism to be the church, to live our lives accordingly, that they may grow and come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ when the gospel will slam into their soul and they themselves will choose to follow Jesus Christ. And maybe you're sitting there saying, that's not my gift, that's not my ability. It's your responsibility, even if it's not a gift or an ability or a passion. And I'm thinking of a dear friend of mine, Greg Bringle, who was involved in our student ministry. Sometimes he taught, and less than that did he go on a retreat with the students, grades seven through 12th. But every single Sunday, week in and week out, he was at the door of our Christian Life Center when our students were coming in and greeted each and every one of them by name. That's not my gift, to know all of your names. Who have I asked this morning? First time here? No, we've been here 20 years. <laughs> to know a student's name and to see them and acknowledge them is a powerful ministry. It is our, all of our responsibility to pour into the lives of our children. From within the context of this community, our children come to know and experience the love of God. And so often we reduce church and God's love down to a participation trophy that everybody gets. And we reduce our message to God loves you and we want you to be happy. So do whatever it is that makes you happy because we think being happy is the same as being holy. And Leah Gregory said, our Christian goal is not to make our children, not to make more people happy. It's not to be more fully human. Rather, it is to be like Christ, more like Christ. Not to do what makes us happy, but what makes us holy. And holiness leads to wholeness. As we pursue holiness in the context of community, we experience wholeness. And that's what we're pouring into our children, that they might experience wholeness. Our children who are a tremendous gift, they're ours in Christ. And we've been given the task of stewarding over our children, positioning them in the faith to follow Christ and to thrive in the fullness of life and those two are inextricably linked and connected and one and the same. Life in Christ, the fullness of life. Marvin Church, core people. We are a people in covenant community with God and with each other. We are marked by repentance, accountable to each other, consumed by the Holy Spirit, filled with holy love. And what if Marvin Church was known as that church in Tyler where, man, those adults are pouring into those children? And what if every time Sarah Scott made an appeal for volunteers, we were beside ourselves stepping over one another to say, put me in, coach, sign me up, rather than, let me check the calendar or see if something better will come along first. And what if our children here in this church were known by name? And what if there was an adult in your child's life who would reinforce the message that you as their number one spiritual influence are pouring into them? And what if there were adults leading our children to be vulnerable and to live authentic lives, faith in Christ as we pursue holiness in the context of community. Someone who knows me and my pain, even my shame. What if our children learned that? Sometimes Sarah and I talk, what does it look for a child in your ministry to be centered in Christ? That's who we are. That's the call that's on our lives as parents of children and adults in community with families. It's not my job, just my job. It's every one of our jobs. And we've done a great job this week, but the week ain't over. The ministry ain't over. It's on us. And God wants to do a work 
in us and through us. So let me pray for us because that's a big work. Heavenly Father, we repent of being complacent. We repent of thinking it's someone else's job. We repent, Lord, of not stewarding like you've called us to steward over the most important thing you've entrusted us with, the gospel. And I pray that for each one of us, how we live our lives, every bit of it would reflect the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would wake us up to the work that you are doing, and I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, because without it, we are grossly incapable. Lord, move on your church. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name.